Good afternoon, everyone. Phil Panarski here with CBS 42 Now. We are going to be joined by the dean of UAB's School of Public Health. Uh, he will be addressing previous vaccine campaigns, prevent vaccine preventable diseases and their campaigns as it relates to current COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. It appears that the dean is ready to speak, so we will send you there live now. Vaccines in the U.S., they work. Second, that over several decades, most of us have accepted requirements for vaccination uh, in the workplace, in some settings, and in schools. And then third, there are lessons that we can learn from our success with other vaccines. My point here is that in many ways, the fact that we have a COVID vaccine and that there are challenges to getting people vaccinated is really nothing new. First, the, to the first point, beginning in 1796 uh, with Edward Jenner's vaccination of a young boy in 1796 to prevent smallpox, we have over 200 years of experience uh, with, with vaccines. In 1999, the CDC uh, published its 10 greatest achievements in public health for the 20th century. And number one on the list was the reduction in vaccine preventable diseases. I believe that there's a chart that we're going to be able to show you that uh, will show this reduction uh, in the number of deaths due to various vaccine preventable diseases. You can see uh, from that list uh, that there has been a tremendous reduction overall when all uh, vaccine preventable diseases uh, are, are um, uh, looked at together, that's a 99% reduction uh, in the deaths from vaccine preventable diseases um, over the last century. That's a remarkable achievement. Now, it hasn't always been easy. It hasn't always been uh, straightforward or without challenges. Um, certainly, we've, we've had challenges and, and obstacles to overcome in the past. Just to name two or three of those, uh, the well-known so-called Cutter incident in um, 1955 with polio vaccine, when some of the vaccine uh, was not uh, manufactured to um, the correct specifications, and almost 300 children um, developed polio from getting the vaccine. In 1976, the uh, well-known swine flu um, incident where not only did we have reactions to the vaccine, the reactions uh, that caused uh, the syndrome Guillain-Barre, um, but uh, we also found that uh, we ended up with actually a, a very small number of, of cases and no deaths outside of the original location uh, where swine flu was first identified. And then through the 70s and, and into the 80s, particularly in, um, in the United Kingdom, concerns about the whooping cough vaccine uh, causing neurological problems. So again, uh, we've had difficulties with, uh, with vaccines over time. But uh, in, in each of these, um, there have been what I consider, at least in retrospect, uh, clear communications about the problems that were identified, um, transparency in communicating that information to people, to parents particularly, um, and um, then uh, improved um, uh, ability for the medical community to actually overcome uh, vaccine hesitancy and um, get people to um, to. To, to come back for, for vaccines. So again, my first point is that we have a long history of, of vaccine use in the United States, and we've been quite successful with vaccines. The second point I would like to make is that for many decades, most of us have accepted requirements for vaccine as a condition for school attendance, um, and uh, for workplace settings. Um, in, uh, in order to attend K through 12 schools, for example, or even daycares, there are certain childhood vaccine requirements. 
Here at UAB, as with most colleges, there are vaccine requirements for all college students to attend. And for those who work in the healthcare setting or the hospital setting, there are additional requirements. Again, these are requirements that have been a part of our lives uh, for many, many years. And again, in most situations, uh, we've accepted those as, um, as a measure of safety, both for us, us as individuals and uh, for the people around us. So again, my, my second point is that um, for, for quite a while, we've, uh, we've accepted the fact that there are vaccine requirements to both attend school and uh, work in certain settings. And then my third point is that there are lessons that we can learn uh, from previous vaccine efforts. And I would say that there are three primary lessons to learn. Uh, first of all is the importance of trust. Um, this um, is, is something that is uh, so fundamental in, um, in promoting and in achieving successful vaccination campaigns, trust. The second thing is transparency. And actually it's transparency that can help lead to and build trust. Transparency in what the vaccines will do and what they won't do when there are complications or side effects or problems such as some of those that, that I raised, that we take a pause, just as we've done with some of the COVID vaccines, and look at the information, look at the data, and uh, communicate that effectively. And then the third thing that I would say that we can learn from, uh, from previous vaccine campaigns is both the mess is both the, the the importance of both the message and the messenger. Um, I want to give you just a few um, a few highlights from uh, a recent survey that some of us uh, here at UAB have completed with over a thousand adults, um, where we ask questions ab about vaccine and in this survey particularly about COVID vaccines. It was interesting to note that um, among all groups, whether you broke it down by race, gender, educational status, the person with whom they trusted um, most for their health information was their health care provider, be it a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, or a physician. So the messenger, the importance of the messenger. Secondly, that when asked, um, the likelihood of receiving a COVID vaccine, about 37% said they were very unlikely or unlikely to receive a COVID vaccine. And when we ask them, why not? Why uh, would they not receive a vaccine? The top three reasons that they gave, number one, that I'm concerned about the side effects. Number two, that I don't know enough about how well the vaccine works. And number three, that I don't trust that the vaccine will be safe for me. So what we can learn from previous campaigns is that if these are the concerns, then these are the things that we need to address in the messages that we convey by the messengers with, uh, uh, for whom they have um, a lot of trust. Again, the healthcare provider as the single most important source of that information. So again, I think there are lessons learned. And to repeat um, what uh, I have, have tried to emphasize here, we have a long history of vaccines and they work. We've come to accept vaccine requirements for school attendance and working in certain settings, such as a healthcare setting. And then third, that there are important lessons learned lessons that have to do with trust, transparency, and the importance of both the message and the messenger. So with that, I'll be glad to take any questions from uh, any of our participants. All right, thank you, Dr. Irwin. That was some great information. Um, I know that you talked about kind of the history of these public health initiatives. Can you kind of summarize what the role of public health officials, public health experts play during um, something like this pandemic? Certainly, um, you know, there, there are 
several important roles, Hannah, and I would say um, chief, uh, chief among those is actually being prepared in the first place, knowing that this is likely to occur and that, that this is likely to occur again in our future. So being prepared uh, is, is critically important. Secondly, that, that having the kinds of, of information systems whereby we can communicate effectively the information that we're collecting, uh, the many different uh, platforms and methods of communication, whether it's in a media briefing, social media, or in, in other venues, be they academic venues or venues that are, that are open to the general um, community uh, participants. And then third, um, I, th I think uh, important in this, and, and what I've tried to reiterate here, is that in, in order to achieve success in public health campaigns, again, whether we're talking about vaccinations or seatbelt use or smoking, it's important to understand what concerns people have. Um, you know, the notion of meeting people where they are uh, regarding their concerns, the questions they have, and to be able to effectively address those concerns in the messages that, that we provide. And that's uh, very much at the heart of uh, the role of public health. Okay, um, and another question, how do you equate former efforts to what is going on now? You know, it's, it's, um, th there are many similarities and there are some unique attributes to, to what we're dealing with now. It, at least uh, in my experience um, as a public health professional um, in the field for over 30 years, you know, issues about vaccine safety, about vaccine effectiveness, side effects, these are common to previous vaccines that, that um, that I've experienced in, in my own lifetime, whether it's been uh, a new hepatitis A vaccine or a hepatitis v, a B vaccine, a new formulation of the whooping cough vaccine, um, the concerns that, that uh, came in the mid nineties with measles, mumps and rubella. Um, these, are, these, are, uh, these are typical. And, and so what we're seeing with COVID in many ways has similarities to, to, to those. I think the difference for me as a public health professional um, is the extent to which we're so polarized as a society about vaccines. Um, and that, um, that, that um, whether or not one um, supports or believes in vaccines has, sudden, has suddenly become a matter of politics and, and not science and health. And that's something that I had not previously experienced uh, with, with other vaccine campaigns, at least not to this degree. All right, thank you. Um, another one, uh, how long do these public health, specifically public health vaccine campaigns, typically take? You know, they can take uh, anywhere from, from weeks and months to, to, to ongoing to, to years, depending on how, um, how the campaigns evolve and how the receptivity evolves for the vaccines. You know, if, uh, if there are few problems, if there are few concerns that arise, uh, it can be a matter of, of, of weeks as far as the, the major uh, initial push for the vaccine. Um, if, um, if problems occur um, with, with the vaccine, if there are noted problems, noted side effects that had not been anticipated, uh, then it, it, it may take longer. Um, but I think that uh, what we've seen is that vaccines in general, just the whole notion of protection, uh, require a constant steady background uh, campaign, if you will, uh, of providing information that, although as you can see from that chart that, that uh, we showed previously, many of these vaccine preventable diseases um, have uh, been reduced dramatically to the point where many clinicians don't see these anymore, or, or at least not frequently, then we get lulled into a sense of of complacency that it's not necessary to continue with 
vaccines. And I think measles and whooping cough are great examples where when we drop our guard, uh, when we stop vaccinating or, or take a pause, um, that the pool of people who no longer have immunity enlarges and that allows for the transmission and the reintroduction of, uh, of those uh, viruses in the community. Um, and, and, and so in, in some instances, Hannah, the campaigns really never end. All right, um, what can the history of public health do to reassure us now? You know, as much as anything, Hannah, I think what we can do in, in terms of reassuring the public is that um, vaccines have been a part of our work, a part of our existence um, for, for now well over 200 years. That having a vaccine and having a vaccine that's effective is something that, that we're used to or that we should be used to based on our history. And that our history also tells us that uh, there are almost always challenges. Uh, looking at, at that chart um, uh, gives you a sense that, well, it was just all wonderful and easy and straightforward. That's not the case. And I don't want to give that impression. There are challenges. Um, but uh, again, I think building on those notions of, of trust, of transparency, uh, and of the importance of the message and the messenger um, are things that we can take from that public health history. All right, thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the efforts that eradicated smallpox and polio? Certainly, um, you know, the efforts to uh, eradicate smallpox, first of all, was simply the identification that um, there was no uh, reservoir for the virus outside of the human. So humans are the only ones who were carrying or capable of transmitting smallpox. And that knowledge in and of itself uh, was enormous in, in our ability to uh, combat smallpox. Now, one of the first um, uh, challenges, if you will, to, um, or at least, um, uh, legal challenges to uh, mandating vaccines uh, came back in the early 1900s when there was a smallpox outbreak in Massachusetts and the requirement for people to be vaccinated in order to uh, put an end to that outbreak. Um, a person by the last name of Jacobson uh, refused and that refusal ended up in a Supreme Court decision that said in, in certain instances, the public good outweighs the individual um, rights. And that's a famous case that has really been a precedent uh, for a lot of public health um, actions over the many years. And with smallpox, um, the commitment was made by the World Health Organization, actually dating back to the 50s, that this could be eradicated. Um, and certainly with the leadership of people like Donald Henderson um, and, uh, and William Foggy, um, these sort of giants in, in public health history who uh, were able to identify mechanisms and appropriate mechanisms to be able to, um, to identify people who were transmitting smallpox and to be able to uh, eradicate um, that. And with polio, much um, polio has really taken the lessons learned from smallpox to be able to have really good information systems, surveillance systems to identify cases when they happen, to rapidly mobilize and move in and vaccinate those who are at risk from those cases identified. Uh, and to continue to be on the lookout for additional new cases. But again, with, with, with both of those, um, you know, tremendous uh, efforts uh, across societies, across all um, uh, aspects of, um, of society, uh, you know, be they secular, religious, uh, political, governmental, uh, that there was the agreement, the, um, the consideration that this is something that we can do, that we can do well, and that 
mankind, humankind will benefit from this. All right, thank you. Um, what additional resources do you believe could be helpful in our continual battle with COVID-19? I'll, uh, I'll focus again on, on the, the issue of vaccines since that's the topic here. I think that first of all, that, that information and, and awareness, um, I think it's in, incredibly important for us to understand why people who are unlikely to get vaccinated say they're unlikely. Um, that uh, that, that you, you, you might recall from the three reasons that are the top three reasons that I conveyed that our survey respondents gave, it had none of those reasons had to do with with politics. None of those reasons had to do with um, uh, with individual rights. Um, they had to do with concerns about the vaccine side effects, about whether the vaccine would actually work for them. And that's a piece of education and awareness that the right messenger can convey and can convey convincingly. And we believe that one of those right messengers, certainly not the only one, but one of those right messengers is a person's healthcare provider. And so my plea is for healthcare providers, physicians, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, all across the board to take the time uh, with their individual patients to ask about uh, vaccination status and to be open to hearing why someone has not yet been vaccinated and to address their concern without brushing it off and without uh, dismissing it, but to address it in a, in a thoughtful and considerate way. And people change their minds. We've seen that. People will change their minds and get vaccinated. All right, thank you. Well, we are about to wrap up. Um, for those who are joining us, this is your last chance to drop a question in the chat box. Um, if not, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you this last question. What to you is the best and worst case scenarios moving forward with co this COVID pandemic? Well, my crystal ball is no clearer than anyone else's. Uh, the best case scenario is that, um, that the surge that we're experiencing now has um, served as an impetus for people to get vaccinated. And we're actually seeing that in, in Alabama right now and in other places as well. And that with that increase in vaccination, that, we'll, we'll, that we will reach a level of community immunity uh, that will keep us all safe um, and that we'll see this surge um, drop uh, as quickly as it went up. Um, the worst case scenario is that people will remain unvaccinated and allow the transmission of COVID to continue. And every time it gets transmitted, every time it replicates, that's another opportunity for a variant to develop. And so if we're going to outrun the virus, if you will, um, vaccination is the key to that. Vaccination is the answer, the solution to, um, to where we are now. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Arman. It does look like we have um, one more question. Um, with hospitalization rates rising in children and with the Delta variant, what is your message to parents as they get ready to send their kids back off to school? Well, the CDC has recommended that um, all children in, um, in K through 12 schools um, wear a mask. Uh, I think this is a sound and important uh, recommendation to follow. Um, we know that masks work. Interestingly, in our survey that, we, that I alluded to earlier, that, that we completed over 92% of survey respondents said they supported a mask mandate. Now that didn't have to do necessarily with schools, but mask mandates in general. So I would say that, um, that taking the CDC recommendation and operationalizing that, making it operational in schools in a way 
that that students can still be students, the children can still be children, but keeping everyone in the school as safe as possible. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Irwin. And with that, we are gonna wrap it up. Um, I will be sending out a follow-up email with uh, Dr. Irwin's chart, as well as a recording of this briefing. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Irwin. And that was a live press conference with UAB, UAB's Dean of Public, the School of Public Health, Dr. Paul Irwin. He sort of discussed the previous vaccine preventable diseases, how it kind of relates to the vaccine hesitancy that we have been seeing across Alabama and really across the country very recently. Over to the right of my screen, you can see the live COVID-19 dashboard courtesy of the Alabama Department of Public Health. You can find a link to this over on our website, cbs42.com. I will expand it just so we can take a closer look at it. As you can see, the in most, most parts of the state of Alabama are considered to be a high risk transmission for COVID-19. They have a very high rate of transmissions. The only county out of the 67 counties that is not considered high risk is Bullock, but it is still considered moderate. And just a few days ago, we had a few more counties that were in that moderate range, but they have quickly turned into high risk. Just very quickly want to go over some of the things that Dr. Irwin discussed in this conversation he had courtesy of UAB saying that he sort of gave a brief rundown of vaccination campaigns in the past, including the very first one in 1796 with smallpox. He showed a graph showing how few deaths there are now courtesy of vaccines due to certain diseases that we as a society experienced in the past. But he also discussed some of the complications that these campaigns have had with transparency and trust. And he said that these are the keys to creating a successful campaign, specifically with health care providers. Dr. Irwin said that UAB released a survey across the country asking people how they feel about the COVID-19 vaccine, vaccines in the past. Uh, and he said that the top three concerns were not really based off people's political views or anything like that. It was more so people were concerned about the side effects. They don't know about how well the vaccine will work for them, and they don't know if the vaccine will be safe. Again, Dr. Irwin also saying that that healthcare providers are the key to leading to more vaccinations, saying that most people in that survey will listen to their health care providers. He also said that 92 percent of the recipients in that survey also support mask mandates. He made mention of how important it is specifically for schools to continue to wear masks and when you're indoors to wear them. He know, says uh, that we all know that masks work. That's according to Dr. Irwin just a few moments ago. Very quickly, do want to make mention of one other thing. He was asked what are the best and worst case scenarios regarding this ongoing vaccine hesitancy, saying that the best case scenario is that this recent surge we've been seeing will lead to more vaccination, more vaccinations in the state of Alabama. We've seen across the country and specifically here in Alabama that there has been a recent uptick in vaccinations. We heard from Alabama State Health Officer Dr. Scott Harris around 10 o'clock speaking about some of the numbers he's seen recently, saying that over this past week, the uh, ADPH has been reporting about 10,000 doses of the vaccine being given out each day, most of them being first doses, meaning that more people are looking to become fully vaccinated. Uh, but on the flip side, Dr. Irwin said that the worst case scenario is that people remain to not get the vaccine, and this allows transmission of the del of the uh, coronavirus to continue, which could lead to new variants, which could become more contagious or even more problematic for people. We're seeing how contagious the new Delta variant has been. Uh, we will have a full recap of this press conference with Dr. Irwin momentarily over on our website, cbs42.com, in case you want to take a look back at it, in case you missed anything. And we will also uh, link it back to all of our other previous coronavirus stories, which you can find right now. If you have any questions uh, regarding it or if you're looking for a vaccine site or just want to read up on what the latest 
CDC guidance is, especially now that schools are starting to get back into session. Again, that will be available to you over on CBS42.com in just a matter of moments. And you can always stay up to date with all of the breaking news in Central Alabama by downloading the CBS42 News app. It is free for all Android and iOS devices. We want to thank you all for tuning in to this latest edition of CBS42 Now. I'm Phil Panarski, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.